Using an IR remote to control an Arduino project is very convenient. However, there are some things that we need to know to make sure that the remote can work as expected. One example is that different brands of remote have different ways of sending an IR signal, or as it usually called, different protocols. Different protocols means that we need to have some different ways of decoding the signal. Another thing is about the receiver circuit. In many Arduino tutorials, the receiver is connected directly to the Arduino boards. Even though it works well, there is a more robust way of making the receiver circuit. In this video, I will cover those two topics, but I will skip some basics like how IR signal works, so in case there are some basic things that you don't understand, please check the description. I put some other useful IR tutorial links there. First, before we take a look into some IR protocols, let's build the receiver circuit. The first thing that we need is the IR receiver component. Here I am using 1838T. There are several others that you can use like the TSOP1838, VS1838B, AX1838HS, and so on. Before you buy the component, one thing that you need to check is the frequency of the receiver. Because most of consumer TV remote works in 38 kHz, it is recommended that you choose a receiver in that frequency. One way to figure that out is by looking at the last two digits of the part number. Next, check the configuration of the leg by looking at the data sheet. In my case, it is like this, VCC on the right, ground in the middle, and output on the left. Before we connect this into the Arduino, there is one more important thing in the datasheet that we need to check, which is the schematic of the recommended circuit. This is the one that I have. As you can see, there are some capacitors and resistors in the circuit, not just the receiver and the microcontroller. Different receiver might have different configurations, so please check your datasheet. The function of these two capacitors and these resistors is to stabilize the power supply and reduce the signal noise. This configuration is called the coupling circuit. For this resistor, it is optional, and the value is any value larger than 20k, so an open circuit is of course fine. In my case, I left it open. For the decoupling, these are the capacitors that I use. So let's build the circuit. For this tutorial, I also added two LEDs to help us check the function of the remote. Now let's take a look into the sketch. For the sketch, there are five things that we need to put to enable an IR remote. First is the library, then the declaration of the IR receiver object including assignment of the pin, the result variable, starting the receiver, and then the actions including the resum function. For now, the only action that I put is to let Arduino print the hexadecimal code when I press any button in the remote. Now that we have prepared the receiver, we can take a look into the remote. Basically, you can use any IR remote, which most likely will be a TV remote, and any brand should theoretically work. I have a universal remote here, which I can change the signal into several different brands. Sorry, this is in Japanese, but it is written that I can emulate Sony, Panasonic, Philips, Samsung, and EC, and some others. Whatever brands that you have, there are usually two types of button. The first is the continuous button. So once I press and hold it, it will keep sending signal as you can see here in the indicator. By the way, this is only indicator and the signal is of course sent from here. And there is another type of button which is the non-continuous. If you press and hold, 
it will quickly stop and we need to release and press again to send another signal. Next, the difference between brands. Using this remote, I tried six different brands and I found four different protocols there. First, Sony is I think the simplest one. Its button has its code and the same code is repeated when the button is on hold. For the non-continuous button, the signal is sent three times. Panasonic also has the same protocol, but in my experience with this, the Panasonic is really unstable. Sometimes the signal jumps very randomly. Next, I found that NEC and Samsung have same protocols. This is I think the most common protocol used in many Arduino tutorials. This code is very unique because repeated signal will be encoded as FFFF like this. Even for the non-continuous button. As you can see, the last two signals are both FFFF. Sharp has two codes for each button and both of them are sent alternately. For the non-continuous button, it sends six signals. Philip is I think pretty weird. In the beginning, it seems similar to Sony. One button, one code, repeatedly. But when the same button is pressed again, the code changes. And in the next press, it toggles to the previous one and so on, back and forth. Also with the non-continuous, the code is toggled after it is pressed. So at this point, what you need to do is to take note of all codes associated with each button. And after you get the code, we can put them in the sketch. In this part, we put a switch case syntax and put the hexadecimal code and describe what will happen. Here I put two codes, code 1 and code 2, from two buttons, and each of them will turn on an LED. As you can see here, I am using constants, and we put the value in the beginning of the sketch, like this. The 0x in the beginning of the value indicates a hexadecimal value. Let's try this, and by the way, first this is for the Sony remote. Please ignore the flicker, we will fix that in the next video. So yes, as you can see here, it works as expected. For Philips and Sharp, because there are two codes for one button, then we need to add two other cases statement here. For one button, there are two codes, and also we add two other constants. So for example, if you use nine buttons using Sharp or Philips remote, you will need 18 codes. This is for Philips. As you can see here, the code changes each time we release and press it again. And this is for Sharp. For the NEC, it is a bit more complicated. Let's see our loop diagram. For the sketch that we've done so far, this is what the loop consists of. Only checking the incoming signal, turning on if it receives the correct signal, otherwise stay off. For the NEC however, we need an additional step. If the incoming signal is not FFFF, we store the value. For example here, 0xc10. But if the signal is FFFF, then change it into the last saved value, which is 0xc10 in this example. After this process, everything else is the same.